So today we are actually talking about uh, a very interesting topic. very interesting topic which um, belongs to Wiener filter and some of the applications which uh, we can see in speech enhancement like the spectral subtraction is also used in many other areas and we will revisit the linear prediction using the Wiener filter perspective so the idea of the Wiener filter came from Norbert Wiener living in the uh, almost end of 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it was actually a breakthrough uh, in theoretical stuff and uh, what he proposed nowadays we see that there are a lot of applications coming out of that and he's just uh, started with the Wiener filter, the theoretical uh, Wiener filter in uh, mostly the frequency domain, but uh, some time earlier than him, maybe two or three years earlier, uh, just in parallel with him, uh, Kolmogorov was also studying the same idea in time domain. So we can say that both at the same time came to the same idea, uh, one in time domain and the other one in, uh, and the Norbert winner in frequency domain. But, uh, that's why the reason that uh, this Wiener filter also called as Wiener Kolmogorov filters. So uh, the idea is is that we want to actually design a data dependent filter with some specific uh, assumptions. So in Wiener filter, <coughs> at least in the beginning of the theory of the Wiener filter, we're talking about the stationary signals or at least we can, we can assume that we're uh, talking about the block adaptive uh, filter. So at least in the block that we are uh, analyzing the signal, uh, the signal is assumed to be stationary. And we know already what stationarity means. So the statistics of the signal uh, for the strict sense of stationary will not change over the time but normally we're not able to uh, go through the um, uh, statistics more than three or four. So uh, that's why we normally talk about the white sense of stationary, which just stands for the mean and the covariance and not the, the higher statistics. So <coughs> when we mean the stationary signal here, normally we mean uh, white sense of stationary or WSS signals, random signals. So, Wiener filter is the signal estimation problem and <coughs> what, what we're trying to do, we'll see in the uh, well, next uh, slide, that what is the goal and what's the, uh, the cost function, we're trying to optimize it. But uh, in general, we can say that Wiener filter is the optimal minimum mean square error uh, solution to the linear uh, filtering problem. So what we're trying to do is to design a filter like Edge to design a filter um, a linear filter like Edge which can be IIR or FIR filter uh, in such a way that the error which is defined as desired signal subtracted by the output of this filter should be minimized in the mean square error sense. So when we say the minimum mean square error, it means that the expectation of the expectation of the square of the error is the cost function that should be minimized based on the parameters, which here these parameters are nothing but the filter taps. So we consider the filter tabs as the parameters and this is the cost function that we have to go through that. So, <clears throat> we have a signal x of n 
that probably this signal is together with the noise. It might be the noise reduction problem. We want to find out a filter like edge. Applying this filter over the signal gives us a signal like YN. And we have a kind of desired signal. We don't know what exactly at the moment what this desired signal is, but it can be anything. We'll talk about different applications that uh, we consider different desired signals. And then it gives us an error. And we need to minimize this error in minister error sense. So, <coughs> in different applications, D of N or the desired signal can be, for example, a future value of the signal. If we mean by this William filtering, we mean to, to do a kind of prediction problem, or it can be a previous value of the signal if we're trying to do a kind of smoothing problem. So, you probably know the difference between filtering prediction and smoothing. So just let me remind you that what do we mean by these three different types of problems in random estimation theory. So if you have a kind of if you have a signal, assume that we have got we've started the signal to get it from time zero to time uh, t that's the input signal that we have. So if we are trying to, and this is for example x zero, and this is x of t or x of n, which is the current time. So here is the current time. So if we are trying to figure out what is the next sample, what should be the next sample? which is x n plus 1. If we are just trying to figure out what's the next sample, then the problem is called prediction. This can be for the next sample or any of the samples coming in the future. So, at least it can be the next sample. If we are trying to predict it, then the problem is called the prediction. If we are having a data from time 0 to time t or time n and we are trying to estimate the signal at time t or in the current time, we are nothing, we're doing nothing but a filter. So probably the signal that we've got at this moment is noisy and we're trying just for doing the filtering to get the signal at the same time doing a kind of process. And if we're trying to get a signal in the previous time, previous and the current time, like t prime, then the problem is that we're using data from here to here to predict or to estimate the signal in the time which is already passed, and that's the problem which is called the smoothing. And it's clear because we are somehow using this part of the data which is also something like the future of the time that we are trying to estimate the signal and in general we are trying to smooth our estimate to get something in the past. So that's called smoothing problem. And here by the design signal what we mean is exactly the same thing. So if we are trying to get a value in the future that's the prediction or if it's in the past, then it's called a smoothing problem. Because y of n is the output of the filter, so the filter convolves with the input, which is x of n, and depending on how many taps for the filter we consider, it can be an IIR, an IIR filter, or an FIR filter. So if we have infinite number of the taps, we can assume that it's an IIR form. And if we have, for example, a limited number like n, then it's nothing but an FIR filter. So we're trying to minimize this cost function. This cost function is quadratic, so it's convex. And we can easily go through the convex solutions. And one of the easiest ways is to get the gradient.
So what we need is the first derivative of the cost function with respect to the taps of the filter should be calculated and then equalized to one to zero for all the k values of filter taps. If we go through the calculations, we see that replacing the error with the desired signal subtracted by the output of the filter and then considering that the output of the filter is nothing but the filter's version of the signal, the, the input, which is here, then we replace it in this equation and we get this as a chain rule. But we know that the error, the error signal here, the first derivative with respect to the filter taps is nothing but minus x of a minus k. So it just depends on this term. So what we can understand from this, because it should be equalized to zero, what we can understand from this is what is called the orthogonality principle. The orthogonality principle. What does it mean? It means that the error signal is orthogonal to all the inputs. The error signal is orthogonal to the all to all the inputs. So in, in some sense, what we're trying to say is that we are trying to say that. We see that uh, y of n is the sigma over, it can be an FIR filter for simplicity. So h of k and x n minus k. So and v of n which is the desired signal. And the error signal, error signal is actually P of n minus Y of n. So, here we see that Y of n, or output of the filter, is the linear combination, linear combination over the input signals. So it means that, assuming we are drawing everything in a two-dimensional space. So assuming that this is a plane, this y of n, this y of n, is actually inside the plane, which is spanned by the input signal. Because the linear combination is always in the same plane as the original ones. So y of n is in this plane. But d of n, the design signal, should be out of this plane. So d of n might have another dimension, extra dimension. And the error between these two is nothing but if you if you calculate the linear combination of the signals in the input domain, so this linear combination, for example, would give you such a thing as the y of n, depending on how many these coefficients are, for example, h0, h1, h2, whatever. And the error is just the projection of the projection of d of n over this y of n. So that's the error signal for e of n, which is always orthogonal to the input space. And y of n is actually existing in the input space because it's a linear combination of the inputs. A linear combination of the inputs is always in the input space. So that's called the 
orthogonality principle. So the error is always orthogonal to a to the input signals. Now, replacing the error with the corresponding uh, values of d of n and y of n, but we should consider that uh, because here we have x n of minus k, and this k is the extent k that we have, but here it, this k was just a volatile variable that was changing over the taps, so uh, in order not to, to contradict with the uh, with the derivations, we just change the uh, variable of the loop here uh, to the i. And here we have the derivation, derivation with respect to the, 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 the k index. So we just change this. But this k is the real k that we need. And we see that getting the derivation, we finally get to, to this equation because it's equal to zero. So replacing that, we see that the expectation over, we can say that this is the cross correlation between the desired signal and the input, equals to the linear combination of this autocorrelation. And we already know that the signal is assumed to be stationary. When it's stationary, this autocorrelation only depends on the time difference between these two signals, or the lag. So, by giving different name to this, the first expectation, the cross correlation, and we call it as p of minus k, then what we get is this autocorrelation function, which just depends on the time difference, which is i minus k, and the filter tabs, and we just replace the order, left to the right and right to the left, and we get this p minus k. This is called the Wiener-Hoff equation. So the Wiener-Hoff equation, and it's for IAR case if the filter tabs are going from 0 to infinity, and for FIR it goes just uh, for a limited li number of the tabs. So this is the very important equation, uh, as I mentioned, it's a Wiener-Hoff equation. Now the point is for different k values, for different uh, filter tabs, let's see what we can get. So that's the Wiener-Hoff equation on the right hand side and the side, and we go through different k values. We see that for different k, k0, k1 to km minus 1, if we expand the Wiener-Hoff equation, what we get is like this polynomials. And then rewriting everything, assuming, and of course it's a fact, knowing that the autocorrelation function is symmetric, so that uh, if you flip the, the signal, the, the inverse of the uh, argument doesn't make any difference, and replacing it here, then we say, then we see that we, we, we have, again, the autocorrelation uh, matrix, R, we already have seen this, where? AR modeling, linear prediction, these are all giving the same autocovariance matrix, the full autocovariance matrix. The filter tabs, and the right hand side, which is the cross correlation between the desired signal and the input signal for different values of k. So the equation is written in the matrix form, the vector form of R H equal to P. And what we need is this filter tab for the optimal winner, winner solution. So the winner solution, the optimal winner solution is nothing but the inverse covariance matrix times the P, which is the cross correlation between the desired signal and the input signal. That's the solution to the Wiener-Hoff equation. Okay.
Let's go deeper inside this cost function. So, rewriting the cost function and changing to the vector form for example here, instead of y of n, we use the linear combination, but still we can write it down in the vector form as h transpose x. We know that h transpose x is equal to this sigma. And we know that en squared is nothing but en, en transpose. Then, expanding this expectation and because of the linear property of the linearity property of the expectation, we can do the expectation for each term separately. So what we get is the expectation of dd transpose. d is a scalar, this is signal time n. So these are the different terms. And we already know that this part, this expectation, is already named by p. And here, for two different parentheses, we use the k and i index for the same term. In order not to, to actually mix them up. So, we get this autocorrelation. And using the vector form, we see that this expectation is nothing but the variance of the desired signal. So, the cost function is the variance of the desired signal, this relation, and this variance which belongs to the uh, input signal when applying the filter. And we already saw that the optimal winner solution is inverse covariance times p. So here, if you apply this winner solution inside this cost function, we see that we get to, to this solution. So just to make the simplicity, and you will get to the final terms here. One important point is that, and you see that here are r minus 1, which is just the identity, you can replace it. And what you get using the winner or the best solution as a, in a winner sense, then the cost function changes to that, the first uh, closed form solution, which is nothing but the variance of the desired signal minus a term. Rewriting the cost function, the general cost function, this general cost function is uh, with respect to any filter. But this one in the top is with respect to the optimum winner solution. The filter tax are getting from the winner solution. So we see that the general cost function is nothing but cost function based on the winner solution plus this term. This term is always a positive number. If you look at the properties that I mentioned in one of the lectures that we had for the random signals, and one of the notes that I put it in the website, yes, the website of the course, one of those 10 properties of uh, autocovariance metrics was exactly in the same in the same way that it's written here. So this autocovariance is a positive definite matrix. When it's positive definite, any configuration like this is a positive number. And it means that this general error is always 
the error of the winner plus a positive number. So it means that the error of the winner filter solution is the minimum error in the mean score sense. Because the entire cost function was convex function. The entire cost function was a convex function. So it was a parabolic. And this minimum we can achieve using the winner solution, which is j hat here. So the minimum of this solution is nothing but j hat. Which can be achieved by the inverse covariance matrix times P. And we know that when the, the function is convex, then the optimum solution is the global minimum. When you're minimizing this cost function, the local minimum and the global minimum, they coincide. So that's the global minimum. Okay. Maybe I can write something more about here. Let me write it here. So because the auto covariance matrix R is positive definite, and one of the properties of R is, is uh, you know, we have already mentioned that it can be uh, written as the square root of, I mean, the square root for this matrix is always unique, and you can find it. So the EVD or the eigenvalue decomposition always can be performed from this R matrix, for the autocorrelation matrix. And we can write it down as U, V, U, Hermitian. In general sense, Hermitian, but it can be U transpose. So U, V, U transpose or U, V, U Hermitian, depending uh, upon the, the, the values of the covariance matrix, whether they are complex or just the real values. So it's in general, but for the real values, you can just use the transpose. And applying the PCA or the KLT transform, we can assume that V is the U Hermitian H minus. So these values in the parentheses, I'm replacing them. I'm actually trying to to write it down based on the eigenvalues. So applying the KLT or the PCA, uh, we have the V as the U Hermitian H minus H hat for the winner solution. And then the cost function based on these V values, the V vectors, can be written as this J hat, which is the winner solution, the winner optimum solution plus V, V Hermitian D, V. And D is a diagonal matrix which includes the eigenvalues. And here you can just write this down as the uh, expanded version, which is lambda k v v Hermitian. K k v k conjugate for different k values from 1 to n, for example. Which also can be written as. Lambda k, the absolute value square of the chain vectors or the PCA vectors of, uh, of this system. So you can change the system into the PCA uh, coordinate values, and uh, these coordinates are v, and you can replace them, and you can get this as the replacement. In some of the articles, you can see this kind of solution, or it, the, the cost function is written in this form. Okay. 
But let's go to the special case, one of the special cases of the winner filter, which is the linear prediction problem. So when linear prediction can be revisited using the winner filter, when the desired signal D of M is supposed to perform as a, lean, as a prediction. So if it's a prediction, then the winner filter can perform like a linear predictor. So it means that we have signal for time values n minus 1 till n minus m. So the output based on these values is a linear combination of them. In the linear prediction form, can be written as that the top expansion. So the output of the filter, we already saw that in the output of the filter, we have x of n passes through the filter edge and gives us the y of n. And this is the desired signal, d of n. And the error here. But we saw that what we're trying to do in the error minimization is to make this y of n as the good estimation of d of n. So what we want is y of n to be the estimation of d of n. And the error was the difference between these two signals. Now in the linear prediction, we need this y of n or estimation of the signal, this desired signal, to be the next value of the signal, as is mentioned there. So y of n or d hat is nothing but x hat of n, the next value, while we have the previous values of the signal x n minus 1 until x n minus m. So that's how we set up the winner filter for the linear predicting. So the solution should be similar to linear prediction because linear prediction was also the best minimum and square error solution. Okay? So here we can understand the relation between the AR modeling, linear prediction, and the winner filter solution. You see that? But we can understand the winner filter is maybe a more general sense. It can also be performed for smoothing and so on. So it's called the one step forward linear prediction because what we try to, to predict is just the next sample of the signal. So one step ahead, one step forward prediction. X of n. To be predicted, why we have the previous values, x n minus 1, uh, backward. So, yeah, I made a mistake here. D of n here is the x n, not x n, uh, so it, uh, it's x n plus 1 when we have from x n to x n minus n. Uh, doesn't matter, but we know what, what we want to say. So, if the desired signal, is the time is exactly the, the, the same time that we have the signal is just filtering and if it's just the positive value of the signal in the future is prediction and if it's in the past as I mentioned here we're doing the same thing here we, we're doing the prediction so that's why here as I, I changed the notation d of n to the extent plus, plus one uh, of course the hat or estimation of that and we have to do that based on the values of the signal that we have times the filter class because it's supposed to the signal, the input signal is supposed to pass through the filter to give us an estimation of the desired signal which error should be minimized for and this is the error the real next value the desired one, the real next value and the estimation estimation of that <coughs> the minus square error sets. So doing the winner solution, we will come up to this point that R, this is just the winner of equation. And this P vector is nothing but the cross covariance or correlation between the desired signal and the input signal. 
in time, based on every uh, k lag or k tap of the signal, so it's like n minus k and the desired signal. Here, the desired signal is supposed to be x n plus 1 because we're assuming that we have from x n backwards for m values of the signal. And if we just replace it with k equal to 0, k equal to 1, and so on, we say that it's nothing but exactly the same thing we have on the right hand side of the Yule-Walker equation for the linear prediction. The li linear prediction finally came to the Yule-Walker equation, and the linear hoof is the solution for the winner filter. But the right hand side of the winner hoof equation was P. Using those assumptions for the linear prediction, we see that P is exactly the same as R. So we get to the Yulmaker equation. So that's the linear prediction revisiting using the linear filter. And the solution, the same as what we had for the linear prediction, should be for the winner solution. The minimum cost function, the minimum winner sense cost function, replacing the winner solution will be like this. And that's the error, is a scalar value, which is the autocovariance of the matrix R0. We know that R0 is the variance of the signal. R0, when the signal has, I mean, when we're calculating the autocovariance without any lag, so it means that we are getting the expectation of the signal by itself. And it's nothing but the variance. Have a question? So, it's a variance of the signal subtracted by this value. That's the minimum, the minimum error in the winner solution sense. And for the linear prediction, we saw that P is R, exactly the same as what we had in the linear prediction. And the desired signal, the variance of the desired signal is exactly that R0. So everything is okay. The solutions of the linear prediction we had already and the winner solution, using this assumption, they completely match. Now, we are going through the algorithm which is normally explained during the linear prediction problem, which is called the Levinson-Durbin. I already said that you can find this algorithm already written embedded in the MATLAB, so you can just write down the Levinson turban and you can find the solution for the winner or the, for the linear prediction. But here, I thought maybe it's easier to understand it, so I brought the Levinson turban here in this lecture. So the Levinson turban algorithm is a recursive way of finding the solution for the linear prediction or for the winner filter. From one of the properties we already had for the autocovariance matrix, we saw that the overall autocovariance matrix for, I mean, the next autocovariance matrix when we have one more data sample can be recursively calculated based on the previous version of that. So here, this autocovariance matrix is like we are finding for the next sample. So Rn plus 1, having Rn, Rn plus 1, having Rn, can be written as this form, which is R0, R transpose, Rn, Rn. So this is Rn, the matrix related to the Rn. Rm is when we have the signals from x, for example, 0 to, or x uh, n to backward to x n minus n. And now there is one more signal, one more sample added, for example, x n plus 1. You just want to get the covariance matrix based on the previous covariance matrix. The new one based on the previous one. It can be easily calculated using this generalization form. Or 
based on the properties, or it can be written as Rn of backward R backward transpose and R C. You are the same. And R backward is just flipping the order of the R vector from down to up. So whatever R is, backward is just flipping the orders. So this is one of the properties I already mentioned in the properties of the covariance metrics. <coughs> Based on the cost function that we have. If we rewrite everything in the matrix form using this property, we can write it down in this form. We can just simply examine it. That R0 minus R transpose H should give you this is the scalar value, the minimum inner of solution. And R minus this our edge should be zero if you go uh, if you uh, expand it and the left and right hand side to simplify that you will exactly get the same solution for r minus r, uh, uh, r inverse p or for the winner solution with the lp solution uh, r inverse r so that's something that we can easily validate through this matrix form relation. We define this vector. So here these are the filter tabs. The winner solution for the filter tab. So this is the vector, the column vector. And this is just one scalar. So if we get this as a new variable called AM, a vector. A M, then we can write down the scalar form as this equation. So this is nothing but the upper side of the vector form. The idea of Levinson and Durbin is how we can update the values for this vector AM recursively using the previous values of it. So it means that AM can be written in this form, in general sense, by updating. We can mean like this, that AM should be written in this form. So it's AM minus 1 plus a coefficient, so times this vector. And this AM minus 1 backward is exactly the same as AM minus 1, which is flipped. The orders are flipped. So it turns out that the linear prediction, one step ahead or doing the linear prediction in the future and doing the smoothness in the same lag for the past, they both give us the same, the same results in this way that if the desired signal is for the next step, for example, xn, minus, XN plus 1, doing the prediction in the, uh, the future, we get the equation like R, the filter step H, equals to this value, which is R, this is R1 up to Rm. And if we do such a thing in the, in the past to do the smoothness, if we make the desired signal to be something in the past and we do the smoothness, xn minus n, which is, this is the, the, the head of this vector, input vector, and this is the tail. So they are both ends. If you do the smoothness, the same 
wave with a winner filter. Then what you get is RG is equal to R, with this R is just the backward version of this. And this G relates to this H using this equation. So this G is just the samples of that filter from the end to the beginning. So based on that, the updating formula for the vector AM can be written as the best forward prediction plus a scalar coefficient, which is also called as a reflection coefficient, times this vector, which depends on the best backward prediction. And if you write this equation in the scalar form, so it can be written like this, AM. K for any k values, any k taps from 0 to whatever number of the taps that we assign for the filter. So this is the scalar form, it depends on this amount m, the coefficient. The boundary values are when k equals to 0 and when k equals to m, which are 1 and 0. And that can be extracted from the previous, uh, from here. So the equations here. So if you look at this equation and then multiply both sides by the next covariance matrix coming from x plus one on both sides, we get this equation. But the point is that this left hand side can be simplified to this, based on what we, uh, I already wrote here, and if you expand the AM like this, that's nothing but this scalar value, which is the error of the winner filter, and this is the vector length M vector 0. The second term, if I write it down based on the backward version of the, so RM plus 1, based on the backward version of the covariance, so that, the first one was based on the forward case, and this is based on the backward R. If you write it down like this, using uh, this vector, and then applying that, we get these two equations. And we see that this is nothing but the previous value of the winner solution, a vector from zeros, and just the scalar value, we'll call it delta n minus 1. And these backwards are so the vector is from R0 to Rm, or uh, I don't know, R1 to Rm. The backward case is from Rm to R0 or R1, depending on uh, what it was in R. And the third term on the right-hand side, which is this. So in general, what we get is this equation. For every term, you can write it down like this. And the Levinson and Durbin algorithm can be rewritten in this form. So we initialize it with the, the minimum error to be just the variance of the signal, and the delta, which is the scalar value, to be the R1. The autocovariance with one step lag of the signal. And then we go through the loop. And in the loop, by changing the m values from 1 to n, filter taps. We try to get the coefficients in a recursive manner, which is delta n minus 1 over j n minus 1 from here. And then the first one, so we update this, we update the delta n minus 1, and we get the value for the n, and we go through every n tap of the filter, and this way we can get all the filter out of that. So that's the levinson durbin algorithm. It's already in MATLAB, so if you want to implement it, you don't need to go through the, all the stuff and to write it down by yourself. But it's just for your knowledge. You can know that. And uh, in MATLAB, if you just look for Levinson Durbin, and it will give you the command. And in this command, you can get all these delta values and the JN values. So the errors and the delta and the AN vectors, you can get all of them. Also, you can get the filter tabs in the end.
Okay. Now let's look at one of the applications for the Wiener filter. One of the very famous applications of the Wiener filter is for noise reduction in the speech signal processing. So one of the enhancement methods, speech enhancement methods that we are talking here right now is a speech enhancement using the Wiener filter solution. We have different types of speech enhancement methods. So spectral subtraction, which is, is I mean, uh, I'll explain it later in the SQL. Wiener filter and statistical methods. I skip over the statistical methods and sub subspace methods because the, they need more theory to, to go and to delve with. So we just resort to the Wiener filter and the spectral subtraction in the general sense. They are useful and you can learn it. And they are also applicable for the image, in image uh, noise reduction. So in Wiener filter application for the noise reduction, we assume that the problem is Y of N signal that we get is the input signal X of N, I mean the, the clean signal actually, corrupted by the noise N of N. So at any time N, the signal is X of N, something that we desire to get it, to have it, plus some noise. And this noise is background noise, additive noise. We assume that signal, at least for that frame that we are looking for, is stationary and is independent from the noise. This is the sign of independence. So signal and noise are independent. When they are independent, the cross covariance gives us zero. So the expectation of x and n should be zero. And in general, the autocovariance matrix for the input, for the signal that we have as observation, y, is just the sum or the superposition of the autocovariance of the signal, clean signal, plus the noise. So there's no cross term that we can write here between this x and n because they are independent. And exactly because of the same thing, this uh, cross covariance between x and y, it just depends on the x and not the y, because the y depends on the noise, and noise is not related to the signal, uncorrelated with the signal. From the winner solution, we know that the best filter we can assume is inverse covariance matrix. Of the, of the observation, which is y. The observation signal here is y, so we can change it to the y. Times the p value, which is the cross co correlation between the desired signal and the observation. Observation is y, what we desire is x. So, if you just remind yourself that in Wiener-Hoff equation, what are exactly this P and the cross covariance coming from? I mean, from the, to just conceptually know that it's from observed signal, it's from the desired signal. So you can easily, if somebody changes these values of x, y, and d, and so on, with different, different other variables, you can just easily replace it. Because you know already that this P should depend on the observed and the desire. That's what that gives us the best winner solution. The point is that here, this inverse, which depends on the observation, on y, y, is the superposition of the covariance matrix of the signal and the noise, the clean signal and the noise. So we replace it here by replacing in the equation, we, we get this the first And it's what the Kolmogorov in 1941 got it, 70 years ago. 
So if that's the, if the filter tab that can, that can actually do the denoising, the time domain. What Wiener did, he replaced the time equations with the frequency one. So y of omega, x of omega plus n of omega. Then, if we just replace whatever we have in the time domain to the frequency domain, it means that we need to get the Fourier transform of that. And if we get the Fourier transform of that, so we know that the Fourier transform for the covariance matrix or the uh, autocovariance or autocorrelation would be nothing but the power spectrum. So we get the power spectrum. Power spectrum is just a scalar. So the values, this inverse goes to the denominator and Rx is, is just the denominator. And we can replace this with the power spectrum of the signal over the power spectrum of the signal plus power spectrum of the noise. And this is nothing but the power spectrum of the observed signal. So the PSD, or the power spectral density of the observed signal, is the superposition of the power spectrum of noise and signal, independent. And the denominator is the power spectrum of the signal itself. The point is that power spectrum of the signal, the clean signal, is not available. Signal is normally non-stationary and it's changing you know, the, the variability of the signal is too high. So it's really different, it's really difficult to get the power spectrum of the signal, P of X. But with the simple calculation, the mathematical, you know, manipulation of this fraction, you can see that we can just write it down as the P power spectrum of the observed signal subtracted by the power spectrum of the noise over the power spectrum of the observed signal. And PYY, because we have the signal observed, we can easily calculate this. And also this is only available. The only thing is power spectrum of the noise, which we have to get. And most of the cases, noise is stationary in the environment, like here. Noise is stationary. You have just a background noise, which is Gaussian, or whatever, but it's stationary. You're not, you know, you, the, the statistics of the noise is not changing drastically. It's just stationary over the time, most of the cases. So, if we go to finding this power spectrum of the noise and replacing the denominator, we can get the best filter. And so, uh, so here, dividing all the values by the pop P and N, we get this SNR, so the signal to noise, over this frequency, so over the SNR plus one. So the filter, design of this filter depends on the SNR of the signal. And it's very, very important very important concept that we are in 1946 or 45, he actually got it. That the best filter in the minimum mean square sense, or the least square sense, depends on the SNR. Depends on your SNR. So it means that for every frequency, for example, omega equal to 2 pi times 1 kilohertz. If the SNR is really high, more than 30 dB. If the SNR is very high, it means that the signal is much stronger than the noise. What is the value of the filter? One. One. So you just pass the signal through the filter. You don't need to filter it. The signal is strong enough. But when the signal, the SNR is low, When the SNR is low, then this gets, gives you a value as a fraction. And you don't allow the signal with low SNR, which means a high noise, to pass through. You will somehow mitigate and attenuate the signal using this filter tap. And that's a natural thing that should happen in the, in the nature. 
Is it? It's a natural thing that should happen. The signal is much stronger than the noise. So let it pass through. And if not, stop it. But what is the value that you have to stop the signal with or to attenuate the signal is based on this SNR. And this is SNR, or a priori SNR, the SNR, the input of the filter, which is hard to catch it. So the winner filter in reality should, I mean, it, it's so tricky to implement this winner filter. And there are several algorithms that try to figure out what is exactly this SNR value, the priori SNR value. What we know that this PMN, power spectral of the noise, how to get it? If the signal is always together with the noise, how do we know that what part of this power spectral is because of the signal and what portion of that is because of the noise? It's really hard to catch it. So what they do in practice is they use a VAT algorithm. I already explained the VAT, if you remember, last lecture, voice activity detector. So they try to figure out those frames, those frames that are free of signal and it, they just are noise. So the content of the frame is only noise. They try to find those frames of the signal and calculate PNN just based on the noise only frames using the VAB algorithm. And this is the way that they go through finding the PA, the PNN or the power spectral density of the noise. A practical issue for implementation. Yes. Okay, we can we can have a five minutes break if if you agree with.